and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, things to come if we hear about them. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and a reviewer for the Wall Street Journal and various other publications. And I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hi, everybody. And Steve Marinucci, the world's only full-time Beatles reporter. You can re- read his work in Billboard.com, um, Access.com, that's AXS.com, and in Goldmine, and in Variety, and every week there are 10 or 15 more. I can't keep up with them. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, Steve. Hey, Alan. Hello, everyone. Okay, and today we're going to talk about George Harrison's Brainwashed, just because we've been talking about Sgt. Pepper for most of the last year and thought maybe we would <laughs> we would look into one of the solo albums, and we agreed on that by uh, actually unanimously. Um, but before we get on to Brainwashed, uh, any news items that you want to report, Steve? Well, it looks like Sgt. Pepper is uh, – and it's not really that surprising with all the online reaction is doing really well in the charts. It hit number one on the on officialcharts.com in the UK, and it's going to hit number three in America on the Billboard Hot 200 uh, next week. So – that's really that's really a good thing uh, that it's you know that it's doing well. It also went to number five in Australia, uh-huh. so it's doing. I haven't checked around the world, but uh, that's a good you know that's a, a good indication. I mean, fifty years after it uh, it gets released, it um, it goes back in the charts and hits number one in the UK. So that's that's good. Um, I also oh. put up a story today. This is Monday on Variety that uh, one of the cutouts from the uh, Sgt. Pepper album is being auctioned on the 14th. That would be uh, the Bobby Breen uh, cutout, which is the little head that's turned to the side between George Harrison and Marlena Dietrich in the lower right-hand part of the cover. Uh Um, So, yeah, it's not very often anymore that these things get uh, auction, so that's kind of interesting. They're estimating the worth of it, and I don't know how much this means, or how, whether they'll get there is fifty thousand to seventy thousand dollars, and that's quite a bit. Breen, by the way, it, it was an actor, was a child actor, and I have to admit, uh, I, in my, you know, I'm kind of a, an old movie lover, and he doesn't ring a big bell with me, but he did, he did several movies when he was a kid. But in any event, uh, yes. so that's he came, and, he came from Canada, and right. then uh, apparently he moved to America. Yeah, and U.S. And, so, and he said he never knew how they got the picture of him, uh, where they got it, and why they used it. So, mm-hmm. but uh, but he the Beatles apparently were fans of his when they were kids, and a couple of other things that are getting auctioned is the Andy Warhol Beatles portrait that was used on the uh, cover of the Rolling Stone book on um, the Beatles from 1980. And there's also a, uh, a Swedish 63 concert tour poster from Stockholm that's also getting auctioned. There's a bunch. It's, a, it's an all Beatles auction. And those are just a couple of the highlights. But uh, anyway. And which house is doing it? It's called uh, Paddle 8, which I have to, have to admit I've never – this is the first time I've heard of them. But yeah, there it's in New York. It's in your area, Mr. Cozen. My so former can, area. <laughs> your former area. That's right. Well, you're going to be there again in a few days. But in any event, um, so it's gone going until the 14th, and it's uh, it's paddle eight one word p a d d l e numeral eight hmm. for those of you that are interested in taking a look at what they have. Do you think there's some lunatic collector out there who wants to get every piece of the Sgt. Pepper cover to assemble in his living room? You know, yes. The, yeah, uh, I don't. I don't <laughs> think. I don't think uh, 
it's going to happen. I mean, I think it, it, it's already a little late for that. But, but you know, this is the thing with collecting. I mean, it, once you get a piece of something, you have to go for the whole rest of it, you know? That's right. I mean, I didn't. I didn't <laughs> used to actually collect memorabilia in particular. I, I was more into music and print items. And someone gave me one of the Remco Beetle dolls. It was not only that <laughs> they gave me one Remco Beetle doll, and it was John, and it was missing his guitar. So I not only spent the next few years rounding up the rest of the Remco dolls. But I ended up getting another John because I needed one with a guitar, which means I didn't really have to do it in the first place. Right. <laughs> so now I have you're a, like, you're, a full set. You're like, plus that guy, <laughs> you're like that guy in that in that McCartney video. Um, you know, I wish. What but, from uh, my brave face? <laughs> yeah. 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 I wish I had mm. the stuff he had, but of course he doesn't yeah, really I know, have it I either. Know. He's that, got it from McCartney. Um, right. Right. Okay. So, um, any other? Any other notable items? Well, I was going to have one more thing. Uh, the 14th, three more Yoko Ono albums are being reissued. Oh, right. Fly, Approximately Infinite Universe, and Midsummer. Ooh, wait a minute. Now I forget which of the, what the third one is. But anyway, yeah, there's three three coming out on, on Chimera on the 14th for those of you that are following the reissues. Um, so okay. they're the 14th, and, and the 14th, they have, of, the 14th, 14th of, June. of June. Right. Okay. June, that's coming right up. Hmm. Okay. I actually have a question about the Billboard charts and all. Hmm. And I don't know if we can answer this, but when I heard that Sgt. Pepper debuted at number three, or is, is going to, this is for the week of June 17th, mm-hmm. um, I was wondering, because there's so many variations of it, does this mean that it's the single disc of the new remix that's number three, or is it the deluxe one that's the two-disc version? Or... Is it the deluxe box set? Is it all of them combined into one? How do they that's com- that's how do they that, that I think I think in a case like that they combine them. I, I don't think they I don't think that they differentiate. I, at least I don't, I don't think they do. I mean I've never seen. I can't recall ever seeing. Well, I mean I'd have to. I, I, I don't I don't think they do. I, hmm. I don't have you run do. into any info about the breakdown of sales? Among the different editions, are you talking to me? To, me to you, yeah. Well, either of you, no. but but I know you look into this, you know. So no, I, I have not. The Rolling Stone issue says that it sold seventy five thousand copies, but it didn't break it down, right? As to the mm-hmm. different variations, so that's why I'm bringing this up. You know, I would guess that the single disc version probably is selling the least. Really? Yeah. I mean, because mm-hmm. everybody. I, I think maybe I'm projecting, but I think everybody wants outtakes, and how, whether you're able to or willing to spring for the big box with two discs of outtakes, or whether you're, you'll be satisfied with one extra disc that that has like the alternate pepper as a second disc, I I kind of think probably more people are going to go for that than just the straight up re, um, remix with nothing extra. Mm-hmm. That's just my, my gut mm. feeling. You know, interesting well, to find out. find out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's dig into this. <laughs> okay. If really? any of our listeners knows, you know, let us know. Write to us. Yeah, send us a note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one thing that one thing that crossed my mind this week was whether or not the new mix actually detracts from the the canon. I mean, given that it's not, you know, the offic- it's not a, an official mix, and as we talked about you know that it's ba- and as giles has said it's just a performance do you think it detracts from the canon or or adds to it i don't think i don't, I don't really think either way yeah. really it, it's not part of the canon but it's just something else to listen to <laughs> you know it's like i said before it's just another way of listening to the album mm-hmm. that's all it is the same way let it be naked was the same way love is you know they're not part of the, you know, that canon, the, you know, but... I kind of suspect a, also that, like, 98% of people who buy any of these editions also already have one of the previous right. uh, issues. So. Right. I mean, I would, be, I would be amazed if anybody, if there were any first-time buyers of Pepper 
mm-hmm. from any of the any of the editions that that came out. I mean, they're, they're pro- they, you could you could kind of see that maybe there are a couple of people that young people especially. And if you are, I mean, I'd love to, you know, if you're young and this is your first exposure to Sgt. Pepper, write in and tell us. I mean, I'd love to hear about that. But so many of the um, comments I saw on Facebook were from people who were making comparisons, you know, between the old and the new. So for what it's worth, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see. And and, uh, by the way, Alan, at one point this week – I did a comparison with what you said about the remastered with the the vocals the vocals and the and the remix and I'm afraid to say you are correct about the how the the uh, the vocals sound a lot clearer on the remastered. I was really surprised. But anyway, well, I'm never wrong. The, the, <laughs> huh? You mean you mean the stereo remix, the new one. Mhm. Versus yeah. remastered the the vocal the 2009 the, the quality on the two thousand mine really sounded a lot sharper. It wasn't. I wasn't thinking so much of sharpness necessarily. As I mean, the word I was using was suppleness. I mean, it, the 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 sort of human ebb and flow quality of 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 someone singing seemed a little bit squashed on the mm-hmm. remix. I think. Um, you know, we also got an interesting email from uh, a listener, Bruce Bernstein. I don't know if it says Bernstein or Bernstein, about the release date of Pepper. Um, mm-hmm. Because uh, he he mentioned a Wikipedia article that cites Alan Weiner's book as saying that it was actually in the stores in Britain on May 26th, which could explain the release date of the remaster. But um, And we were, we were trying to find out, you know, if, if that was so, because it, it – isn't said very much, but he um, he then came back and found that uh, Bruce Spicer in his new book mentions that it had gotten into British stores on May twenty fifth. So should, should we should we be rethinking what we think of as the release date of Sergeant Pepper? We always say June first and June second, but you could yeah. actually get it a few days earlier. I think if everybody if everybody I mean if it floats to stores uh, into a few stores a couple of days early. No, I don't I don't want to adjust the thinking for that. I really don't. Okay. I mean, I've seen uh, yeah, other people have commented about that too, but I think that's uh, even even, you know, Parlophone listed as June 1st. Right. You know, why would you, you know, why would you want to uh, no, I don't get that. I, I don't think. And the only re- and the reason why I think the new remix and I didn't I honestly did not check with uh Universal on this. The only reason I think the the new version came out before June 1st was because they were trying to get it out by June 1st. So I, right. I you know, and June 1st didn't fall on a Friday, which is the release date. Right. So I I think that's I think really that was the reason. Mm-hmm. Um I don't think there was anything mysterious about it. I don't think they were trying to do anything strange. I think that was the reason. It was just a, you know, other than the, you know, I, as I, as I recall, and tell me if I'm right, didn't the nine nine stuff come out on on nine nine? Didn't that? Didn't they do that on nine nine because they yes. were able to, right? Well, I don't think it, it, it. You would think that. I mean, I, if anything, you know, the fiftieth anniversary of Pepper would probably be something they could do that with, but they didn't. And they didn't. Yeah. So, anyway. But anyway, okay. the, the whole the whole May twenty sixth thing. I'm sure there's other examples of albums that leaked out before the official release date. Right. But record companies go by that date. Hmm. So right. I guess we should too. Okay. Whatever right. is listed as official. Right. Hmm. Okay. Though, so shall we get on to the main topic? Let's let's do it. Okay. Um, other than to note that we have, I believe, now officially spoken more about Sgt. Pepper than we have about Pure McCartney, which is as it should be. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not in agreement there. You, <laughs> really? We still have never done a proper show on Pure McCartney. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, no. on its 50th anniversary, you can dig me up. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, so all the listeners who wanted more done on Pure McCartney, don't say I haven't tried. 
Okay. Um, so brainwashed, you know, brainwashed is a. Uh, an interesting record in that, uh, you know, like there aren't that many. I mean, there's Milk and Honey is, is the other one that comes to mind, but it's an, an actual posthumous Beatles record. Uh, and um, he was, I think, pretty close to finishing this up by the time he died in 2001, November 2001. And it came out in 2002 with, I think, a bit more work by, you know, Danny and... Um, some of George's colleagues. It was Jeff, Jeff Lynn involved. Lynch. Yeah. Jeff Lynn. Uh, Jeff Lynn, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, what, was, what, what was your feeling about it when it came out and, when, and, and in the run-up to it coming out, Ken? Um, I was very pleased with what I heard. Mm-hmm. I mean, I really think that once you take a look at all the songs, it's a very solid collection. The more you learn about it, the more that you're aware that some of the songs are actually kind of old. Right. I shouldn't say too old, but I mean, Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea was taken off a TV broadcast of uh, Jules Holland from 1992. Well, uh, still, it's it's great to, to listen to something like that, but it's not like it's that these were all brand new compositions because they weren't. Right. And that wasn't even one of his compositions. It was a, you know, um, what's his name? Harold Cat Arlen. Calloway. Cat Calloway oh, yeah. recorded it. Yeah, Harold Arlen, yeah. Ted Kohler. But, and, and, you know, and in fact, I don't know, do you have a copy of that clip, the Jules Holland clip, where they, they do Devil in Deep Blue Sea? Because this is a different take. It's it's notably um, different in a number of ways. Okay. I I've, It's been a while since I've watched it, but I'll have to listen to that. It's really noticeable? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can't remember the specifics, but I but I know that it was you know I I was pretty familiar with the video clip by the time this came out, and I was kind of surprised when I played this the first time um, that it was different. But um, yeah, I mean he must have had a number of takes of it, and Danny chose a different one than was on the video, which is which is always kind of nice because it means that we've got two. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So and then yeah, you know, there's other songs like Run So Far, which. George gave Derek Clapton to do. Right. It's on his Journeyman album, and mm-hmm. George, in fact, played on it. Right. Stuck Inside a Cloud is supposed to be a song from between 33 and a third and the George Harrison album. Mm-hmm. Because I remember one of my favorite radio specials ever, there was a special that came out for Brainwashed, and there were some amazing interviews in that special from Olivia and Danny and Jeff Lynn. And Jim Keltner was in there, and he talked about Stuck Inside a Cloud as a song that he remembered far back, Mm -hmm. which still, you know, whenever he heard it later on, he just got emotional hearing it. So Annie Road was also uh, an older song, and uh, I'm sure you guys know that we got to hear Annie Road before this ever came out. Mm Mm-hmm. On the uh, on the MTV interview, on the with, MTV. Uh, yeah, it was John, uh, Fugel, John sang. Fugel sang right. when right. Um, George was promoting Chance of India with Ravi Shankar, right? And John Fugel sang was egging him on to perform some songs, and he did that song, and we'd never heard it before, right? right. So um, that song had been laying around, and I believe the story is that that was around the time when George was making a video for, I believe, this is love. And there was a sign that George saw in Hawaii that said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. (laughs) And that led to writing that song. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a handful of songs there that are not entirely new, Mm -hmm. but you combine that with all the newer ones and it's, you know, song for song, it's a very strong album. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, did did we know um, what his... Thoughts were about pulling all these things together. I mean, I, I I had the impression that he left Danny some blueprints of of sorts. Um, but did do we know if if he had the running order and and that kind of thing? Not that, not, that, not that I'm aware of. No. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. My- no, I just I think he just felt that he knew that if he left it in Danny's hands and Jeff Lynn's hands, they'd have a pretty good idea of what George would have wanted anyway, even, you know, with the blueprints and anything else that they still had to question. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to ask Steve the same question, what your, your initial feeling was when it, you know, there are good posthumous albums and there are not so good posthumous albums. And 
I think you can directly compare this one to Milk and Honey. Milk and Honey wasn't a bad album, but because it was so, partially because it was so unfinished, it's not as good overall as this is, as Brainwashed is. The thing that's so amazing about Brainwashed is how good it was practically all the way through. It wasn't perfect, but it was really, really. Yeah, I mean, it was really great. I mean, uh, in terms of, I mean, I saw one review, I think All Music calls it his best album in 30 years. I'm not sure I'd go back yeah. to that far. But, but it's, I mean, it was, it's an excellent album. It really, really is. I mean, Any Road is brilliant. Vatican Blues mm. is brilliant. Rising Sun knocks me, knocks me down. Beautiful. Marwa Blues, Marwa Blues. I think uh, made me uh, get emotional the first time I heard that. I just absolutely, absolutely love that. And as I recall, and I did not look it up, that won a Grammy, and it should have. Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea, I mean, that was great that that uh, he did another Hoagie Carmichael song. Um, Brain that wasn't that wasn't Hoagie Carmichael. That wasn't Hoagie Carmichael. No, we were just talking about that. That was uh, Harold Arlen. Oh, is that Harold it's Arlen? Like, okay. Yeah. Uh, Harold Arlen, as in Over the Rainbow, Harold Arlen. Right. Uh, um, that's who. That's who that is. Okay. And Ted um, okay. Um, so I mean, that's a you know, that's a great song. If there's one thing that they should have done, they should have put Horse to the Water on here. That song would have fit in perfectly, and it. It. I mean, it, it's a great song, and uh, I've always hated the fact that it's kind of sat out there all by itself. Yeah. Uh, and, but, there were, uh, and there were two of those too, <laughs> right? There's a right. It, when it first came out, it was on on small small world big band. It was five right. minutes, and then uh, they uh, Jules Holland put out a best of friends uh, compilation where it's five minutes thirteen seconds. So collect them all. Ah, Jules, <laughs> ah, Jules you, you person, you. What can we say? Yeah. But I mean, that's really the the thing, and. and Again, I don't. I don't want to down Milk and Honey too much because Milk and Honey is is a good album, but the fact is that it wasn't as finished an album as Brainwashed is, and that's one of the nice things about Brainwashed that it has a completeness to it that Milk and Honey had. You know, was a, a rough album. Uh, so I mean, but you know, it's really. I mean, it's not a throwaway. It's not anything like that. It stands on its own, and that's what's the nice thing about it. Well, Milk and Honey, to me, when I first heard it, there were songs in there I liked, but I was kind of disappointed because it didn't sound finished. But over the years, I've come to really love Milk and Honey, uh, with the exception of Forgive Me, My Little Flower Princess, which I kind of felt the song, as a song itself, John didn't finish writing. There was something missing there, but... I like the looseness of the songs on Milk and Honey. It sounds mm-hmm. more like, you know, a rehearsal, but a damn good rehearsal. You know, whereas... Well, it sounds, uh, it sounds more fantasy, like... Yeah, it Double more Fantasy. Like Lennon. Yeah, but D- Double Fantasy sounds very tight, you know, very polished, mm-hmm. um, whereas Milk and Honey is much more raw, but it's it's great that way. Well, but yeah, it's, it's a big difference between that and Brainwash. Brainwash was a... You know, it was a, a finished product, and and uh, Danny and Jeff Lynn worked on it and perfected it and did the best that they could, and it sounds finished. And that's the distinction between that and and, and Milk and Honey. I still think that you know, had John been around to finish Milk and Honey, I think it, you know, who knows what we would have heard. I mean, you know, where he would have gone with that. I mean, that's not. We don't know that. Uh, you know that it would have sounded as it as it did. At least the songs would have sounded as as they did. As so, much as I love um, "Grow Old with Me," imagine if we had a studio recording of that from mm-hmm. right, John. Right. You know, that's right. that song is so absolutely brilliant. It's a masterpiece, mm-hmm. and we just have the demo of it, which is lovely in its own way. But if we had John in the studio, maybe with an orchestra, whatever whatever kind of touches he wanted to add to it, it would have been so good. It would have been mm-hmm. a classic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, even even in the demo version, it's you know uh, it's got a charm. I think she was smart to put the demo version on there, and I don't know if she put it on there just to 
because she had the demo or because she wanted because she could have taken that and done something with it and she didn't and that's probably one of the really nice things about the song she i mean you know how she is with uh, how artistic she is and how she looks at everything through an artist's eye and i suspect that that's how she looked at that song and why she didn't do anything with it and i think that was a i think that was a good move given what she did do with it so, but back to back to brainwash. I think there are just so many. Uh, I mean, rock and chair in Hawaii is hilarious. Mm-hmm. The guitar on "Never Get Get Over You" is is just is just really nice. I, it's. I think this is a really really good album. I think it's a, a really a one. I wouldn't call it the best album he's done in thirty years. I wouldn't go that far. But I think it was a. They did. A, it was a an excellent finish for for George. It's just, it's uh, again, you wonder what George would have done had he been around to finish the whole thing. But uh, still, it it turned out it turned out nice to use the uh, the phrase. I, I mean, have a feeling that 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 Danny and Jeff did such a great job on this album that even if George had lived, it would have sounded pretty close to this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think you're probably right there. I think that's probably true. Again, though, I think uh, "Horse to the Water" would have been a great addition, and I don't know why they didn't do that. Maybe you know why they didn't use it. Uh, it belonged really belonged on this album, uh, but maybe they did it so it wouldn't be a posthumous, so it wouldn't sound posthumous. It wouldn't have the posthumous feel to it because had they you know pulled that track in. It would have, it's, maybe it would have seemed a little more posthumous than it than it was. What and do you What do you mean? I don't quite understand that. So what, what do you have in mind? Because I guess I guess the the timeline of of having the of when Horse of the Water came out, you know, I mean that came out before the album did, right? And it just it, I, I don't know. Maybe just collecting all the tracks at the end would have would have made it sound like a memorial and they probably didn't want to do that. I, 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 I don't understand what the thinking was there though. I, I, I don't, but I don't know. I'm just, just punditing on and on and on. Yeah. What can I say? I mean, my impression is, you know, given the fact that some of these are older songs and some of them are things that we didn't know about, didn't, you know, hadn't heard about, uh, you know, I mean, we knew about the, run so far, for instance, because we'd had the Clapton one, and we knew about Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea because we had the clip. But it seemed sort of like these are things that, you know, George had been recording in his home studio when he felt like it, and then just, you know, put on the shelf. And um, it's kind of, I mean, that has a certain charm, too. This is a, a guy who's, you know, obviously still interested in writing songs and making music, but not necessarily that interested in getting it out there, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. which given the way a lot of his post-Beatles music was treated, you can kind of understand, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to still do it. I, if you know, I don't care whether it goes to the market or not you know i mean it, gontropo is like that in a way i mean he he put it out did no promotion it just sort of sort of disappeared you you almost wondered why he bothered because i i, I really like that album i thought i thought that really deserved more attention than he gave it or that anybody gave it um mm-hmm. but so these things seem like you know just sort of projects he did it's as if we're is it's as if we're getting a, a glimpse into his workshop in a way, you know, or, or what he did musically when none of us were listening because we, you know, we didn't really have access to, to seeing what he was up to. So this is what he was up to. And mm. it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of nice, you know, they're nice old fashioned songs, you know, verses, <laughs> tunes, lyrics, um, unlike, you know the stuff he was complaining about in Blood from a Clone, um, and uh, you know I, I think there are some great songs here too. I mean I love Any Road. I think that's really just a, a you know very clever lyric, and mm-hmm. uh, 
Marwa Blues, as you say. I mean, that's just gorgeous. Rising Sun is gorgeous. I mean, these things have all of those George Harrison thumbprints, his kind of melody, his kind of slide playing, um, you know, the the whole sensibility. And um, even though it comes from disparate sources in, in, in terms of timeline, I think it hangs together really nicely. I don't think it's his best album, Um if I were going to pick one, it, it would probably be Cloud Nine, maybe, or or uh, All Things Must Pass. But but it's 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 really a nice listen. And um, I remember at the time it came out, you know, a lot of anticipation about it because mm-hmm. we had you know really no way to know what to expect, what was going to be on there, and they delivered the press copies in. A Walkman, a CD Walkman, that was glued shut. The disc was glued into it. Really? Yes. So, and and the headphone was glued onto it. <laughs> so, hmm. so I don't you, think I don't think I got one of those. I did, and um, you know, because so you couldn't make copies, and uh, wow, you know, and so naturally, I, I mean, I don't know if if everybody was the same as me but I, I saw that as a challenge and I managed to get a copy <laughs> pretty quickly um, you know you could pry the player open without wrecking the disc and uh, and get the disc out and uh, yeah so unfortunately that means that I don't any longer have the Walkman Play. with the thing in it which probably would be uh, you know who knows maybe are those collectible Probably. <laughs> didn't Probably. Ha- didn't have a logo on it or anything, though, you know, so I don't know. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I remember, you know, really waiting for it and, uh, you know, and then it, it finally turned up first in that form. And um, I, I probably waited until I finished writing my review. I think I, re- I reviewed it for The Times. And uh, once I finished that, I felt I could pry it open if worst comes to worst if i ended up ruining it well the disc was coming out in a couple of weeks anyway so (laughs) (laughs) yeah one thing uh, and alan was even kind of talking about this with george it's very important to note that after cloud nine he never put out another solo album of all new material yeah he just put out the traveling wilburys and he put out live in japan and uh, the compilation of Best of Dark Horse. So it was his choice to stay away from, you know, the public eye and to and to release anything. And so, you got to wonder why. Mean, you uh, got to wonder why, because, I mean, if, if his last album had been Gontrapo, okay, fine, you know, nobody, it didn't do anything. But Cloud9 got a lot of attention and was very well liked. So why mm-hmm. why do you think he didn't do anything else after that? Well, remember to remember he was, uh, and I don't. I'm not sure how the how the years correlate, but remember he was happy just being home, being a gardener, mm-hmm. for a long time. And and you know, I think it, we've talked about, you know, how his relationship with the record company and how he got ticked off at them. And I think that had, you know, I think that had something to do with it. I think he just kind of for a while just said, screw it. I don't need, you know, I don't need to do this anymore. Mm-hmm. And then I, and, and I, you know, I've thought about this, you know, over the years. I mean, it, I, and I really get as a very deep Harrison fan, it bumps me out that there were so many years that we did not get stuff from him that we probably could have. And, um, and I think that's, you know, I think that's all part of it. And it's too bad. I mean, it's really a shame that he, that that's what happened, you know. Um, I mean, I'm not, you can't get mad at him, but, and then I think what happened, and then I th- I'm guessing what happened. I mean, and I, and let me say that I'm guessing is that when he got ill, he realized that he needed to, you know, he had music he wanted to get out and he was going to have to get it out. Mm-hmm. And, so that's, you know, that's a shame. Um, I don't know if that's true. I'm just, that's just a theory that I've had. I mean, what do you guys think? Oh, I, tell, I totally agree with that about George feeling that he had to complete these songs. But I also agree with you that I remember 
how long a wait it was going from Gontrapa to Cloud9. It was, it was five years, the same way that we had to wait five years for John. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, but George kind of felt that, you know, he'd achieved enough. He loved making music. He didn't care as much whether or not it went to number one, uh, or, you know, whether it was a blockbuster album. A few times I've heard him comment about the fact that, you know, he had to do interviews, like in the case of Cloud9, because the record company expected it of him. If he had his way, he probably wouldn't do them. He only did them because he had to. It was part of the game, and that's what the record company expects of you. Same thing with making videos. You know, He didn't want to have to go through all that, but he did love making music. That never changed. And the fact that he had his own recording studio where he could record whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted at his leisure, these are songs that through the years you know, he wrote and recorded, or at least partially recorded. So, and and hopefully there's plenty more. But um, to go back to this album, uh, I would say that Marwa Blues is absolutely stunning as an instrumental. And the the slide guitar work on that is so gorgeous. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's one of the most beautiful pieces of work. I know Olivia, it's a favorite of hers. And Rising Sun is also so absolutely, it's, it's a perfect recording. It's one of his best recordings. And the sly guitar work in there is just so perfect. You know, everything about that recording is so wonderful. The lyrics in, in, in this album are fantastic. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got mm-hmm. all the different sides of him. Right. And I especially like, um, well, a very poignant song is Looking for My Life. Because if you read the lyrics of it, it certainly sounds like something that he wrote towards the end, as though he's aware that the end is near. There are certain mm-hmm. lyrics in there where you, you know, almost every verse. Had no idea that I was heading toward a state of emergency. I had no fear where I was treading. I only found it out when I was down upon my knees looking for my life. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, um, he's sharing something really personal with us here. Pisces Fish is also a favorite of mine. Very folk oriented. I, I think I've said on this show it's kind of Dylan-esque. One of my favorite lyrics from him which I think is is showing a very personal side, explaining how he is. He says here, I'm a living proof of all life's contradictions, one half's going where the other half's just been. You know, powerful stuff. Yeah, and what's really good with those songs is the way the music folds in. It's not just not just the lyrics. The the music folds in on those on those um, songs beautifully. I mean they're they're just they're just amazing um, the way they. I mean, with the with rocking chair in Hawaii, the the little jab at Dylan at the beginning there was just it was just absolutely wonderful, mm-hmm. you know. And there, I mean, there's all sorts of you know. You have examples of 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 Harrison's humor on this album of his you know of his philosophy of you know he gets very serious in a couple in a couple of points, and it's it's just a, a, a you know. It makes you sad that this was it. You know, it's too bad that we haven't heard more. You know, maybe maybe what would happen inevitably if they pulled out another album, you know, of unreleased tracks, is that people would end up comparing it to this, or you know, and and I that kind of thing. Maybe that's the reason why we haven't heard so much from from George. But I mean, this is a beautiful album. It really is. So. Mm-hmm. I got to ask you, what what is the jab to Bob Dylan? In the imi- the imi- imitation, he does an imitation of Dylan at the beginning of Rocking Chair in Hawaii. I never really noticed that. <laughs> yeah, I heard is it that, that way too. Very, yeah, very, yeah, I thought so. Yeah, yeah well, he, does, Rock- he does. He does. He does. He does kind of a in the same way that John Baez, you know, kind of makes fun of him. Uh, you know, she, he did the same thing at the beginning of Rocking Chair in Hawaii. Yeah, you can. I, I think you, it's definite. Uh, it's definitely there. I mean, you might not want to characterize it as a, a, a jab so much as no, a, I, a, I, I, a, an illusion. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, it's a little. It's a joking. I mean, it's yeah. all, it's all fun. It's right, all in right. fun. He's not. It's not. It's not a. By jab, I don't mean he's. He's. You know, it's us. He's stabbing him, or he's. You know, 
criticizing like, him. Like, ser- fact- like serve yourself is, uh, you know, mm. for John, that that is really kind of a sarcastic look at, at uh, Dylan, and well, not just Dylan, but you know, it's basically it's basically a response to you got to serve somebody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and that's that's pretty obvious. Yeah. Uh, so, but this this is just a you know kind of a, a a passing tip of the hat you might say you know? right i think i think it was meant to be taken it was meant to uh, for dylan to take it as a joke and to smile at it because that's that's the way it seems to me it was I, nothing more serious than that okay so. well you guys know that that song rocking chair in hawaii george had worked on as far back as all things must pass there are recordings of that mm-hmm. and in fact it was pretty much based on um, Hank Williams' song uh, called Long Gone Lonesome Blues. Right. Because if you listen to Hank's recording, it even has that that riff in there, you know, da 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 Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's definitely, it's definitely pulling, pulling all sorts of things in there. And, and your mention of the Hank Williams influence probably was a kind of a, a nod to Dylan too because Dylan was a big Hank Williams fan so mm-hmm. what about the title track I mean we haven't really talked about that and that's uh, that's a distinct side of George too it's the I think the same impulses as Taxman in a way you know he's mm-hmm. very taking a very sort of I don't know if cynical is the right word but he's he's looking at, at society as a whole and governments and everything and 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 taking a, a very sort of critical view. Right. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. No. You know, George always was very cynical. You know. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm looking at the lyrics here, and I'm. I'm. In fact, I, when I was listening to it a little while ago, I was listening. I was listening. I was going, "Damn, he. He's. He's. It's so current. Just, it's so current. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Brainwashed by the military. Brainwashed under duress. Brainwashed by the media. You're brainwashed by the press. Brainwashed by computer. Brainwashed by mobile phones. Brainwashed by the satellite. Brainwashed to the bone. Bingo. Yep. You know, I mean that's amazing. So yeah. If you heard the the radio special that I was talking about before, Olivia Harrison was talking about the song, and just saying that George George was fed up with all these things in life that we are brainwashed by in our society, and we should just get back to nature and the simple things in life, and not be tied to uh, cell phones all the time. You know, and um, so this song really illustrates that. Mm-hmm. Very well. I also love PT Vatican Blues because it it brings to mind all the problems that we've had in recent years in the church and all the sex scandals. Mm-hmm. Uh, it makes me think about that, and and it also brought to mind when George brought up the Pope, you know, and awaiting on you all. Mm-hmm. So it kind of has that similar feel to it. Well, the mm-hmm. Pope owns fifty one percent of General Motors, so I, I love that that side of George too. I, th- I think though you have to you have to give a little more weight to though to brainwash since he made it the title track. Oh and yeah, I think, th- I think there was definitely a reason for that. Uh, and if he's making any kind of a statement with this album, I think that's it. And, which you can you know debate that one for whatever you know wherever you want to go with it. But mm. yeah, I think that was definitely if there's a statement with this album, that's it. I'm not sure I agree with doing that, but. I think he did, that's what he did. I would have actually think any any road would have been a better ongoing statement, but that's me. Mm-hmm. So any road yeah. is the one that sticks with you longer. I mean, brainwash is almost sort of lost there. You know, I mean, in this in the whole discussion so far until just now, we've talked about so many of the others, and and it's it's only now we're getting to this, and um, mm-hmm. and it's the title of the album, as you say. Uh, right, I think Rising Sun is the is probably the other, you know, if there's a, if there's a couple of tracks that really really stick out, I think Rising Sun is the other one. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, along with along with Marwa. Uh, uh, well, we all have our favorites. I, I right. definitely think Any Road is catchy as hell. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, um, I probably would have picked that as the first single, although I do really love Stuck Inside a Cloud a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that one, Rising Sun, definitely very catchy. Um, and when I think about hits, I do try to think of songs that are commercial. So I would certainly put Any Road in that 
that category as I would Rising Sun. Are those the two most commer- songs that you as a radio, a radio person would see? Uh, were the, would those have been the two most commercial, Ken? Hmm. Probably. That doesn't mean they're my favorites. No, I'm just it, saying, it, yeah, I'm saying yeah. in terms of in terms of programming them, you know, if you're a if you're a, an FM uh, programmer in in the day you know, when this album comes out, and you're looking to program tracks, would those have been along with Marwa? I think Marwa too. But I mean, you're talking about Rising Sun and Annie Road as the two you would have gone with. Yeah, they're probably the two strongest. Mm-hmm. You know, I could see album uh, album rock stations playing those. Uh, more so than I would Stuck Inside a Cloud. And I do love Stuck Inside a Cloud, don't get me wrong. Um, I could hear uh, rock stations playing Pisces Fish. I could hear them playing P2 Vatican Blues a lot. I seem, um, to, I seem to remember just about the whole album got played, and a lot. I mean, it didn't... It, I mean, you tell me. You tell me. Not at all. Not at all. If, any, if anything, I was extremely disappointed that I didn't hear it being played on the radio that much. Stuck really? inside a cloud. Stuck inside a cloud got some airplay on adult contemporary stations where it charted, but it didn't chart that high. Mm-hmm. And as a matter of fact, I was quite stunned that the album didn't do better because it made the top twenty, but it didn't even go top ten. And this is a year after George's passing. You would have thought right. there would have been a lot of interest in it. Mm-hmm. Right. It's kind of interesting. Milk and Honey took. A little more than three years to come out. We had to wait. It was painful to wait for Milk and Honey. <laughs> but Brainwash was a, a, a year. So it was still fresh in everyone's minds, that George's death. So I was really kind of surprised that it didn't get as much airplay. I didn't hear that much airplay at all, Steve. Really? To tell you the truth. And it certainly deserved it. Hmm. It seems to me. It seems to me about the first half of the album got played and the, the second half... Did not, except for maybe Brainwash, because it was the title track, but okay. Well, I never heard anything being played on the radio, with the exception of Stuck Inside a Cloud, and to a lesser degree, Any Road. That's mm-hmm. all I ever remember hearing on the radio. Okay. All right. Well, in any event, I mean, it's still, it's it, 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 uh, there's no getting around. It's a... You know, I, I don't want to use the word masterpiece because I, I think that's probably overselling it a little bit. But it is a—it's an album that, had he lived, he could have been proud of the way it was. I mean, there's no, there's no question about it. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty close to a masterpiece in my eyes. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, um, in many ways, I love, and we've talked about Gontrapo here. Mm-hmm. Gontrapo is an album that was completely ignored by the radio, and, and part of the reason is George's own fault because he didn't promote it. But I didn't hear anything on the radio of Gontrapo other than Wake Up My Love, and that was minimal airplay yeah. for that one song. So we're just talking about not so, the quality and and uh, the commercial success are two completely different things here. I, I think, I, I, and I think, and I remember when we talked about that, and I don't think Gontrapo was as even an album as this was. I think this was a more even album um, all the way through. Um, it's got some ups and downs, but I think uh, it's definitely um, overall uh, a much more... What are you doing back there, Alan? Yeah, I'm looking at the box set, and uh, I don't know if we need to talk about the various different editions, but it came out, uh, let's see what the year on the back, I think it was fairly soon after, um, in a sort of more deluxe presentation, this black box with um, brainwashed and the dark horse symbol and George's signature in black on black. It's really nice looking. Um, mm-hmm. Has the standard CD in it. And um, a poster of the album cover, and a George Harrison guitar pick, and DVD. Mm-hmm. So, Steve, it's something which uh, the the DVD has a, the making of the album, and so. there is a Dark Horse decal as well. Ooh. So <laughs> that must this this version must be way out of print, right? Is this still possible to get this? No, it, yeah, it's still on Amazon. You can get it uh, depending on who you click on. But, yeah, you can still pick it up for, I think, a reasonable amount. Okay. Um, any other observations about 
the album, the individual songs, uh, the prospect for 20th anniversary version in five years? I don't think so. I don't. I don't think they think of anniversaries that much. I know that's kind of funny saying that after we've just had a Sgt. Pepper 50th anniversary, but those are few and far between. I just don't think they think in those terms. I think a 20th, so an- 20th anniversary is too soon. It won't. They won't do anything for that. Hmm. I think okay. we're probably going to get more early takes, although it's taken a while. Yeah. I think that's what the plan is. And I just hope that we don't have to wait too much longer for Volume 2. Yeah. But um, that's going to be the right forum for all the unreleased stuff. Sure. I could see. I, I'd be interested in hearing some early takes of these, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, of course, they could. I mean, they really could take the version of Any Road that he played on the Fugelsang show right off the soundtrack. I mean, it's a, it's a different version and uh, be sort of nice to have it preserved on a disc or actually by then it'll be a stream. <laughs> right, mm-hmm. right. But, um, yeah, yeah, no, that would yeah, that would be that would be great, and uh, that that special or that uh, interview had Ravi Shankar, and they were talking about Chance of India, uh, that's right. They, right? Yeah. So there's another there's another album uh, that was in that Harrison uh, Shankar box set that came out right uh, a couple of years ago, but that uh, that was a great album too. Uh, that was uh, that was a lot of. If you're into Indian music, that was a, a wonderful uh, piece that they both did together. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I was just going to say that there are so many sort of shows and appearances like that that are kind of uncollected. I mean, his Dick Cavett interview is out in a Dick Cavett box set. Um, he has put out, or he, his his uh, family has put out a lot of you know the promos, most of the promos by this point. Um, the song promos, but there are a lot of things like the Fugel Sang interview. I mean, and, and when I say a lot, I actually mean relatively few. I mean, because as, as we said, he wasn't out there doing interviews all the time. Mm-hmm. But but I think there is actually sort of a nice collection to be had if if they could pull those together, you know, and put out a, a DVD or two of of some of his TV appearances from over the years. The Cabot stuff is still available. Through right. Shout Factory, through Shout Factory, right. And that is, uh, there's actually, I mean, he did the Lennon Ono interviews and the Harrison interviews on separate DVDs, mm-hmm. and those are well worth getting. If you don't have those, you really need to get those. Not just for the Harrison interview because it's it it really is good, especially when they uh, introduce the band and and. Uh, you hear, you see Harrison in the background there, which is really kind of funny. But the, of course, the Lennon Ono interviews are just incredible. Those are just amazing. You know, there's also the um, you know Rutland Weekend TV special where he plays the pirate song, you know, mm-hmm. right. otherwise uncollected. Uh, so the second be- uh, so Paul is the second Beatle to do pirate a pirate, not the first. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There we go. Hmm. We forgot we we didn't we didn't mention that last week, did we? Yeah, right. Son of, a... of course, now we have to think about whether Ringo got close to that in any of his films. I mean, he did have an eye patch, I believe, in Listomania. So, well, he was, did he really? I think he was supposed uh, to be Pope, though. Not quite a pirate, okay. but <laughs> well, Blind Man, mm-hmm. Blind Man would be the probably the closest to where he became because I think he was a bandit in in Blind Man. Hmm. So, I mean, you could kind of call him a a, a land lover pirate in, from Blind Man, but <laughs> okay. But then John never John never did anything like that that I can that I can recall uh, no. even <laughs> even in all the films with Yoko. So, oh well, we're and, really we're really reaching for something to are, say. We oh. are. <laughs> we, we really we really we're we're getting really geeky here. No, we'll someday maybe, this. This will make a trivia question someday. Which two Beatles played pirates? That's right. There we go. There we go. Okay. By the so, way, did, did you, one more question. Yeah. Did you see the guys see the USA? Had, had, you guys have not seen the movie. I take it. Am I uh, the yeah. only one? I'm I have the only enough. one. This movie. Well, USA Today said he he'd gone to pirate, and and I will admit when you first look at him on the screen, it you have to kind of blink your eyes a little bit, but. 
I mean, there's no mistaking the voice when he comes in and and starts talking that that it's him, you know. So, mm-hmm. but, you know, I saw that I saw that article, and it made it sound like yeah, he he tried very hard to sound like a pirate, but in the end, they let him keep his Liverpool accent, right? And see yeah, Maggie May. Right. There's no. Uh, you know, I miss the Maggie May completely because he, uh, as I recall, he sings it at the beginning, not at the end. And so I, I mean, I didn't know when they were coming on the scene. I, although I had my suspicions because I knew he was going to be. I had heard something. It involved something about a jail cell. Okay. And so when they showed him, and you know, I kind of went, "Oh, there he is." And by that time, the song was already gone. And I'm not. I don't know that I'm going to go back and see it. I'm sure we will <laughs> down the road get the DVD, and I'll be able to see it. And now, hopefully, they'll have some outtakes from that on the DVD. That would be that would be nice. That'd be uh, fun. <laughs> I have not seen I have not seen the the soundtrack though, and I'm curious as to whether his version of Maggie May is on the soundtrack. And I have not. But I again, I have not seen that since uh, we've seen the movie. But uh, let me let me say again that if you like Pirates of the Caribbean, you will probably like the movie. If you have not liked Pirates, you probably won't like the movie all that much. Although there are two good scenes with Johnny, besides the McCartney scene, there are two good scenes with Johnny Depp that are that I thought were great. One's at the beginning and one's a little later on than that. But anyway. Hey, before we go, just want to say um, that on our next show, we'll be giving our thoughts about the new PBS special on Sgt. Pepper. So we haven't deliberately avoided it. We will be talking about it on the next show. Okay. Okay, guys. So (laughs) maybe we should wind up. Um, Yeah, maybe we should. Yeah. Okay. So... Ken, how do people get in touch with you, and what kind of contests have you got coming up this week? They can write to me by email at everylittlething at att.net. Also on my website, as I'm sure, well, hopefully you know, every single week I have Beatles trivia, uh, in which you can win one of nine amazing prizes, including the new Sgt. Pepper CD, Flowers in the Dirt, the special edition with the bonus disc of Elvis Costello demos, the acoustic demos, books from Mark Lewison and Kid O'Toole, a great selection of prizes there. And um, sometime this week, um, I'll be giving folks the chance to win a pair of tickets to see Joey Molland in concert. And you may have heard about this, guys, but he is going to be performing the entire Bad Finger Straight Up album. Huh. He's doing that in concert mm. now. And um, he's playing at Daryl's house. In Pauling, New York, on July the second, and I have uh, several pairs of tickets to give away. Just go to the um, upcoming concerts and events page on my website to find out how to win if you live in the area. So that's uh, on July the second, Joey Molland at Daryl's house. And one more thing: if you happen to be in the New England area this coming Saturday, I'll be one of the MCs at the Fab Four Music Festival which is an all-day event. It's 20 acts from the New York, New England area, all Beatles tribute acts, all performing throughout the day. There's um, an indoor stage and an outdoor stage. The outdoor one is the one that I'll be emceeing. It's called the uh, uh, Octopus's Garden stage. So if you happen to be in the area and you want to have a whole day of Beatle music, come on by, say hello to me. It's at the Oakdale Theater in Wallingford, Connecticut, this coming Saturday, which is June the 10th. And Steve, how about you? How do people get in touch with you, and what should they look for coming out from you in the next week? I just put out the, the Variety Gear article today on the Sgt. Pepper auction. Um, I don't have anything to to reveal, okay. um, but um, you can get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I have a Beatles News and Information Facebook page and a Beatles News and Information Yahoo group that you can join. And the two of them do not do the same thing. So I'm, you know, I, I post there, and you're welcome to talk about anything and everything. And there's been some very interesting posts, especially on the Facebook group lately. So yeah. if you're not there, there, I've been getting some great story uh, great links um 
that I've been posting. So um, please come and and even if you just say hello to me, um, I'm there. So okay, and you can write to all of us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter with the at symbol things we said fab. And we have a Facebook page, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans, which Steve just alluded to. And if you want to contact me, you can contact me through Facebook on either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And so I think that's about it. So for Steve Marinucci and Ken Michaels, this is Alan Cozen saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.